If you've been paying any attention to the competitive Card Fight Vanguard environment in the last few months, you'd know that we currently exist in a meta where Morphess is tearing up premium and Luard continues to be a menace in V. Now in a normal documentary, this is usually the point where someone would say, but this wasn't always the case. Unfortunately, dear viewer, I'm afraid to tell you that it was always the case. In this yellow card Vanguard video, I'm taking you on a history lesson throughout the G series. The story of how Luard evolved throughout the G era is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting stories in competitive Vanguard. Let's jump back in time around five years. It's towards the end of 2016, a time before people were locked up at home because going outside was a health risk, and before the world's two biggest superpowers had only just started their downward spiral. A simpler time, where the G format was stable and reboots were nowhere near on the horizon, let alone a second reboot. The big dogs right now are still Night Rose, Gears, and Sanctuary Guard Blasters. The Loire Trial deck had just released, and GBT09 also had many critical cards for the deck, as well as giving Angel Feather a second chance at life after losing Refros. Up until this point, Shadow Houses' existence has always basically been some form of Revengers or the Blaster Dark Diablo Legend deck that released a few years ago. Of course, there was just a new anime series with an edgy new main character who was just misunderstood. He had a new Shadow Paladin archetype. Luard was one of the first cards in the game that introduced an alternative stride cost, and of course, everyone was excited about this. Plus, on the horizon, GBT10 would come out a few months later to give the deck a little bit more of a stim boost. Hopes were high, and there looked to be some synergies with older cards, so this was perfect for both new Shadow of Paladin players and returning ones alike. Dragheart Luard marked a significant shift in Vanguard's design principles. Gone were the days of aggressive Grade 2 gaming now that Ripples and 70s had both been kneecapped, and with it, decks could start playing real games again. And boy was Luard a real deck. At first, it felt a little bit underwhelming, because what are you doing? A bunch of stuff with Grade 1s? You can just play Sanctuary Guard. And at least that had the blaster engine going for it. What was so special about Shadow Paladin that we'd have to move to Luard for it? Well, as it turns out, nothing. The deck was just very, very good in a lot of areas all at the same time. It wasn't anything special though. Of course, it wasn't winning as much as Night Rose or Gears. And of course, you can't talk about 2017 without talking about 7C's Night Runner, which also shut down Luard completely. But what the deck did have was a combination of simplicity and inevitability. You see, when it comes to piloting a deck in an event, there are two main paradigms. Can the deck win any given game, and can you, the squishy sack of bad decisions in an anime sitting at the table, get it there? Decks such as Night Rose and Time Leap were incredibly complicated and required you to know exactly how far you could extend and which combo route you were going to go down next turn. And then at the same time, you had to juggle all your pieces and sequence your attacks properly to ensure that you either didn't get hit by a defensive and shut down your combo, or your opponent didn't just chicken you out of the turn. Luard didn't really have this problem. Sure, Denial Griffin sucked, and you had to count the number of grade 1s in your deck on a regular basis, but the obvious stuff that you did need to do was good enough, because you didn't need a higher player skill to manipulate your combo routes. And it was good, especially compared to the other low effort decks. Royals would just care about seeing a handful of specific cards and bashing face, and Luard could do the same while also drawing a bunch. Decks like both Link Joker variants also drew a bunch of cards, but could never reliably close out a game. At least, not compared to Phantom Blaster Diablo. So at this point in time, Luard was kind of like a jack of all trades. In a time where decks were still built to only do one thing, but do that one thing well, this was a nice breath of fresh air. You could play aggressively to respond to situations where your opponent was weak and capitalize on the Howell and Caden combo, or you could play it slow and whittle away at their resources thanks to the plussing from Belial Owl. This inbuilt plussing engine combined with Dragheart Luard's recycling effect, meant that when it came to the War of Attrition, you were always favoured to win out. And when your opponent gave you that one inch of opening, Phantom Blaster Diablo would come in and take a mile. There was a lot of flexibility in the list, but the critical thing is that you had the Hull and Caden engine that would generate you enough resources and power that you could commit to a push turn whenever you felt like it, and you had Aura Geyser Doomed with Belial Owl that would just draw you 5 cards during the main phase like that was a normal thing whereas most decks need to commit 12 or more slots across 3-4 to four cards for their core combos and engines, all of Luard's moving pieces were just 2 card combos plus your toolbox of strides. Striding into Aura Geyser meant that all you needed was a Fodler for some Belial Owls or maybe even Ravens, whereas striding into either Diablo Stride meant that you just needed Hole and Caden. 
Except because you were Shadow Paladin, who could easily search out Grade Ones, meant that you only needed Hull. Beyond that, you had a whole swathe of other utility pieces like Abyssal Owl for Counter Charge and Sword Breaker for even more draw. Of course, it wasn't just do good things that made the deck a contender. It was extremely well placed into the meta. Gears was still the most popular and arguably best deck of the time, and not only could it multi-attack Pokemon into Oblivion, but it could also draw a few cards and set up defensive plays with Hetra Round and Gear Cat while it did so. Doomed was the perfect solution for this, because you would just pop the cat in the main phase with Doomed while drawing a whole bunch of cards to make up for what you just guarded with. Those guards usually being grade 1 5k shields that Tiny Ips attacks needed, which were perfect for filling up your drop zone to hit ritual count. So Luar had established itself as being able to overcome the weak early game that stride based decks had become reliant on. The fact that it could plus after guarding a bunch and make up that deficit was what put it ahead. But the deck still wasn't perfect. Time Leap was still dominant and Night Rose still had outs to it. Of course the other big reason that the deck wasn't nearly as heavily represented as it should have been was because due to the hype and secondary market, pushing the price of stables up to past $20 a copy for Ezras and Belial Owl, the deck still cost anywhere from $300 to $400 to build from scratch, and that was a lot even back then. But the groundwork was there. People saw it as a deck that plussed hard while grinding out and eventually blew you out with a Diablo top end once you couldn't commit enough resources. And just like the Gears of Capitalism, Luard would just keep on turning even throughout its next level of support. At this point, Luard had now solidified itself as being plus 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 boom, compared to Gears which were plus poke plus poke. And that was fine, except with G-Guards and bigger G-Guards coming out as well as decks that could consistently spam a field to dodge Diablo, Luard's boom was suddenly becoming less and less threatening. It needed something bigger, something faster, something that actually guaranteed a win. That something came in the form of Dragstrider. Now at first glance, this is just a cooler version of Diablo, but much like how at first glance Burger King's a cooler version of McDonald's, in the same way that both those chains pale in comparison to Subway, Dragstrider was not the star of the show compared to Naush. Naush provided the deck two major benefits. First, it was an extra form of deck thinning beyond Luard on stride search for plus, and secondly, it also filled the boards with cards you actually wanted to see, in this case those being Belial Owl and Cursed Eye Raven. Up until this point, both of those triggers were great cards that you were happy to see on the board, but outside of Fodler there was no real way to dig them out. And of course, beyond getting Belials to just sacrifice the pieces, there was no real benefit to it either. And the problem with Fodler is that a lot of people lost games because they rode Fodler's 9k body. And sometimes, you just needed more Fodler. This unearthed a very specific interaction that had been available for quite some time, but players had never been able to truly capitalize on it until now. That interaction being Gonvar. You could always put Gonvar behind PBD and make Gonvar a huge booster so that the PBD could push over most G-Guard values, but you didn't have a reliable way of making Gonvar hit those numbers. Plus, a bigger PBD was still not that great. Now, you could Naush for a Raven, Raven for a Naush, and repeat, hitting any number of Belils on the way which would retire for Ezra's so you could keep going. So this was the first part, having lots of being able to call lots of Ravens to make the Gonvar huge. Now the second part was Dragstrider's ability to discard cards to gain more power than PBD could, which was just icing on the cake. This is especially incredible because Luar had become established at this point for drawing a ridiculous number of cards, meaning 70k Dragstriders were a common occurrence. Adding Groan into the mix gave you equally huge rearguard columns, and because you were shoving Ravens back into the deck faster than Marvel can shove media down our throats, the quad drive from Dragstrider meant that those groans were very likely to attack twice, but equally huge numbers. So now instead of Aura Geyser, Belial and Swordbreaker to generate card advantage until your opponent can keep up, you are now slowly getting this advantage in hand to unload them into a huge Gonvar Dragstrider column and make your opponent very upset with a large unguardable swing. Kind of like one of those give me your energy spirit bomb things but edgier because Shadow Paladin. The deck could still grind games out, but now you had a much more reliable Kaboom especially one that didn't rely on the whole Caden engine, which meant the deck could be streamlined much more reliably. Uh, G GBT 12 Luard is probably one of my favorite, like, just decks of all time because of the, the sheer amount of, like, toolbox, not only the extra deck, but the main deck as well has just in store for, like, extra deck, you know, you have Carnivore Dragon for opponent damage denies you, so you can still, you know, re retire to, 
Uh, retire two, draw one, because you retire Blyle Owl on your side of the field. You got Aura Geyser Dragon, which lets you just draw a bunch of cards as well as getting to retire on your opponent's turn. You got Drag Strider, which is the best like mid game, late game stride of the in a deck, pretty much. You got, uh, you know, you got Spectral Diablo, which lets you multi attack or multi attack with the Vanguard if if it comes down to it. If you you got locked on your rear guard circles. Uh, and then, of course, you have Fan Blaster Diablo, which is just a really good card if your opponent has no rear guards. Uh, the deck still also has a fantastic main deck as well. While it's a little weak in the early game with no G, with you know, with like no grade one or grade two like plays as much, uh, you, you can do really solid stuff the moment you hit grade three. Uh, for me, I, I played this tech card, it was a grade three called Gigatank Shutter. Uh, well, you play that with a Fodla on your side of the field. You use Fodla, call two Bly levels. You play Gigan and Shutter on the other rear guard circle. Well, while you have uh, Lord as your vanguard, uh, the moment you then you know attack with Fodla for like 13, boosted by Bly level, attack with the Shutter. Shutter's ability retire two to draw one, counter charge one. You just counter charge the the Fodla cost as well as you just drew three cards thanks to having Lord as your vanguard. The Bly levels go off. Funny enough, that ability is not GB restricted. So it was like, it's a really cool play to do early game. Uh, it's like, a, I call it the mini Aura Geyser play. Uh, the deck is essentially just going to be playing the grind game, like just putting pressure on your opponent a little slowly over time, over time. And then once you get to the Drag Strider turn, you've got your two Groznes, you got a Gonvar behind your Vanguard, and you're using uh, cards such as uh, Cursed Eyed Raven and Drag Wizard Noise to just keep pumping, the, uh, putting them back in the deck, calling new cards out, uh, Using Cursed Raven to call new cards. If you call Noise, Noise is just an on place ability, not from hand or anything. So you can look at the top cards again, call another Raven, just getting all these extenders out of your deck, cleaning your deck out, thinning your deck out, uh, even potentially finding PGs for your neck. Uh, if your opponent somehow survives, you got a bunch of PGs in your hand now. Uh, then you got a bunch of cards in hand, thanks to all the Blyles you just abused. Uh, discard about two to four cards for Drag Strider's turn uh, ability. You're swinging in for at least 45k to 60k per uh, for its attack, while you also have two uh, two rear guards that are both 30 uh, 34k each. They're going to be attack, uh, and if you get, you got a bunch of stand triggers in the deck, they're going like they're going to hit. Uh, one of them is going to restand, so you know going, you're going to at least get four attacks off that uh, that turn. Uh, after afterwards, you know you put all your crits back to the deck, and you just got a fresh deck afterwards of like ve uh, that's just not only super compressed. But also, it's going to be very, like, it's just very good for your next stride turn. Because your, your hand is also, like, really uh, filtered out as well. With G Guardians, one, one of the best ones at the time, Plot Maker Dragon, being a 25k shield by its own. Uh, Astras will, like, she'll just forever be in your hand the moment you go into stride phase. And, yeah. This streamlining process is also what helped put up better results. Rather than focusing on doing a bunch of things well, the ward now shifted to be like the other decks, where it focused on a very few specific lines, but did them exceptionally well. It also helped that Gonvar could be searched up with the stride skill, and this game ending turn could literally come out of nowhere on the second stride. Unfortunately, at this point in time, despite TikTok being sent to the gulags, Zodiac Time Beast was now starting to gain footing as its own real deck. And again, just like with Time Leap, instead of going for one big kabang, ZTB would whittle you down and bury you under its superior engine and resource. Of course, on the other end of the scale, you also had Ichikashima running around, ruining games left, right, and center. So yet another season passed where Luwad wasn't the best deck of the format, but at the same time, it was no strangers to the top tables. With the exception of ZTB, this was considered good going. People who bought into Luwad when it first released had a deck they could feel good about taking to an event, and it lasted the better part of a year. And unlike ZTB, most of the main deck was still pretty much the same. You didn't need to rebuy the entire deck like you did with Vanquisher, Bermuda, or ZTB. Of course, you were still down a kidney from having invested the first time around, so you know you took what you could get. Now, by this point in time, the meta had started rotating on a regular basis, with Dominate coming in, Kagura coming in, and other drops in the pond like Favas, Victor, and even Blasters. Even up until GBT 14, throughout what was known as the Ferris Wheel Spring of GBT 13 through GEB 03. Luard was still a solid pick, but GBT14 is where this would change a lot. Just like how the gentle bounce of my stomach is upset after a box of hot wings, Luard's paradigm was about to be turned upside down. So you guys know how the trope goes. 
Movie star moves to the big city chasing fame and fortune, can't keep up with the hustle and bustle, and before you know it, cocaine is the only thing keeping them sentient even though they're now just a shell of their former self. That's kind of what happened in GPC-14 with Luard, although to be fair to Luard, the entirety of Vanguard as a game discovered hard drugs in GPC-14, so we can cut him some slack. But Gone was the grindy, steady accumulate plus into a single game-winning Alpha Strike style of the old Luard. I'd mentioned previously that the big thing about Luard moving between GPT-10 and GPT-12 was that you didn't need to reinvent the entire deck like you did with Gears, Overlord, or Royals. That finally changed in GPT-14. A handful of key cards remained, like Abyssal Owl, Ezra's, and Cursed Eye Raven, but the fact that the main grade 3 was no longer Drag Heart, but Drag Fall, really hinted at the direction that the deck was going. Having that looming threat of a guaranteed ultimate stride was nice, as was a reliable retire effect. Not needing to retire something for the plus was also another bonus, because at this point now, there was suddenly a lot of board control in the meta, such as Overlord and Messiah. Dragfall itself may not have been anything flashy, but it was definitely a welcome addition, as well as a clear sign of here's where the deck's going to go. Looking at deck lists from the GBT-10 era going towards the GBT-12 era, you added Nalsh, but Grown and Gonvar were old cards. Those being added over the whole Caden engine was a straight one for one, so the other 30 odd cards in the deck remain the same, not accounting for like one ofs and tech choices. However, GBT-14 introduced Dragfall, Gaonan, Dagda, Flamnak, and Daylad, all cards that you play multiples of. And as you may notice, a lot of these cards are about filling up your drop zone with as many great ones as possible and going through your deck as fast as possible. There's still a lot of draw effects and you still have Belial Owl, but the point of the deck was no longer to grind things out and win when your opponent can't. You were now actively trying to win the game rather than allowing inevitability to happen. Dragfall also rewarded you for filling up your drop zone faster than early, because now you didn't have to wait until second stride to get your free stride cost. It worked immediately. Of course, there was one other huge benefit to filling up your drop zone much more aggressively. Drag Abyss. The Morphessa before Morphessa. Ritual X. Oh, so edgy, so cool. But that front row buff was what made the deck much more focused. Compared to the likes of ZTB or Royal Paladin, who would wear you down with several attacks, most of which only needed 10k shield, Drag Abyss basically made your columns unreasonable to guard effectively, and Dagda was icing on the cake. Multi-attack has pretty much always been the best way to win a game of Vanguard, and now Shadow Paladin finally had reliable access to multi-attack. Oh, and Dagda wasn't even once per turn, so again, all those Cursed Eye Ravens you're shoving back into the deck? Yeah, it's all coming together. Problem now was that the deck was, and still is, entirely dependent on finding that Dagda, which is why you played cards that went through your deck at such a high rate. You needed to draw that Dagda and you need to assemble it as fast as possible. And thanks to all the tools the deck had, it was fast and it was very effective. Oh, and did I mention? Because you now have so much early filtering that isn't GB locked and you now have a critical mass of grade ones, first striding Ogma was now a very real possibility. So not only did you still have a great early game that could be used to set your opponent back from going wild on the first stride while you dig for Dagda, but now you also had plays that could actually do things on the first stride rather than just draw a bunch of cards and wait for Drag Abyss. Of course, there was no more draw tons of cards by consuming Belly Owls, but instead, Belly Owl now just supplanted your game plan. You had a new game plan was the only big difference. It was kind of like Christian Bell going from The Machinist to Batman Begins. In the same way that was a similar transition from Gear Chronicle going from Time Leap to ZTB, and again, it was still an incredible pick for the format. Okay, um, so going into the GBD-14 meta, which uh, from the previous meta we were playing was like Chaos. Chaos and Victor were the biggest deck right back in the day. So, uh, and there was some sprinkle over a lot. So that was when the old drag hut, it kind of fell out of viability because needing to retire one rear guard was kind of a hefty cost because you're fighting against Chaos or you're fighting against Overlord. They are, gonna remove your rear guards early on, so you probably would not have a retire target for a drag hard skill, so it became quite... That was when Lua started to fell off the meta. But when GPT-14 came around, they introduced Drag 4 to us, which was, I think, one of the best things they could have done for the deck, because... Um, one, another, another point is that, okay, not needing to retire for the cost is handy, because um, of, being, of having all these decks that can move the rear guards but being able to strike immediately when you ride him is very 
essential because Dimitas was a run was a sleeper deck. Not really sleeper deck, but um a deck that was running around. So sitting on drag half or turn after they're getting deleted, uh, you don't get a free strike out of that. So just riding drag drag four this way and just getting a free strike was very handy. Okay, but okay, the whole deck actually did kind of change because we we ran we ran less accounts of Abyssal Owls as I think most players back then did. So we started to rely on cards like uh Ronan and the owner main people in Japan actually picked up. Because searching for your drag four was essential because you you'll be ditching your grey one anyways. So it kind of opens up more opportunities for you to draw into the drag hearts. Sorry, not drag hard. Drag 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 four itself. And yeah. Another point when transitioning over the wing con from like okay because back in, back in GBD twelve you have a few big wing cons like uh Drag Strider and Phantom Blaster Diablo, which going into the Bermuda meta which isn't as effective because they introduced the Giga Alley. I think most of you guys know from back in the day, the one that gets ten thousand power for every face of himself of herself. Losing those two wing cons, but you gain okay, losing those two wing cons kind of hurt a lot, but they introduced to us uh, Drag Abyss, the one that gives 10k to the whole front row. And that actually kind of helped because not only do you not only do you plus out of this out of this XQ, you are able, you are able to push out damage as well because you give 10k to the whole front row for every four great ones, which can easily scale up to plus 30 to plus 40 in the late game. And adding on a dark die as well actually makes the turn very scary. Like every other deck of the time. Luad might not have been a tournament winning list at this point in time, but it still took a lot of well-known players to the top tables. Let's have a step back and think about what that means. In 2016, you bought a place out of Ezras for $20 each, and now it's March of 2018. Those Ezras are still producing value, you're still playing 4 of in a deck. Same story with Belial Owl. However, unlike with Time Leap, if you wanted to sell out and move on to something else, that $400 you shoved into the deck on day 1, you would still get 400 for it once you sold the deck a year and a half later. In fact, even in the present day, premium Loire decks are still playing Ezras. Of course, the reprint has curbed the price spike, but the card still holds useful value. But in those two years at the end of G format, Loire did more than just be a stable investment vehicle. It provided a glimmer of hope. You didn't just have to play the same deck with a different aesthetic. You could actually play a deck with a non-determinate game plan. You could play a different game of Vanguard every time you sat down. You could tune and tweak your deck in a way that leaned in certain directions. And most importantly, you could do so while keeping up with everyone else. At least, until GPT-14. In which case, it showed that decks can evolve and improve while still retaining their core personality. Despite the overhaul in the deck's paradigm and gameplay style, it was still the same deck at heart. It revolved around grade 1s, it had gradual plussing and burst backed up by deck thinning, and it had a flexible G-Zone lineup. So it's no wonder that Luard's always been a deck that's been regarded near the top for the longest time. After all, despite all the odds, it was able to flourish during the final years of the G era and has continued to do so today. While it's highly unlikely that the deck will ever evolve back to the traditional style of slow, plossing grind into a finisher, it's still very interesting to see whether the deck continues to rely on Dagda or some other innovation causes it to once again change shape. Regardless of the outcome, however, I think we can all place a fairly safe bet that Luard will continue to be part of the metagame for a while yet. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed the content, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel for more. And as always, thank you to the channel's sponsor, Strictly Broken TCG. You can go to strictlybrokentcg.ca and use code SBTCGYellowCard for a site wide discount of 5% off. Doing so also really helps the channel, so thank you very much, and we'll see you all next time.